to have it now. Yeah, can I start? Yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah. Uh yeah, there's much trouble with the the beam projector and the HDMI. Maybe I'm kinda late, four, five or three minutes. Yeah. Anyway, uh yeah, today are we talking about the automating the auto scale the road balancer based on Linux and VM orchestrator. Actually I uh I uh, presented this this kind of uh, modeling and the uh, concept uh, last Tokyo session. Is anyone been there? No. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, because I tried to yeah reintroduce my mother again. Then yeah, uh, last Tokyo summit I uh, introduced my network mother based on the 32 bit subnet and VRF and the VGP and the single NIC. The thing is that this single NIC is just not just for the developer region. It's just for it's it's just for not for not just for the developer. It just is for the the production level too. So it's based on our uh, production system and the cloud. So I divided the compute node inside the compute node. Uh, I divided the the network namespace. Uh, I named it virtual switch block, and the VM itself is on the the global names, global network namespaces. So the VM's VM's traffic comes from this way and goes into this and virtual router. And uh, because we are using the single NIC, we uh, I have to divide it based on the VLAN VLAN ID. The service one is the 60, and the major one is zero. And the VM traffic is, comes go down here, comes go over here, and go out like this. So, and uh, we uh, define the VM's IP based on the 32-bit uh, subnet. So, uh, basically, our uh, in our cl uh, cloud, the VM cannot communicate with uh, with other VM with the L2 level linkers because they we don't support and we don't have any subnet inside of the VM. But the thing is that anyway, it, the, the VM traffic is, comes down from the VM can go out, and the traffic for the VM can comes in because we setting up the whole the router inside of the computer and the TOR, and we and we exchanging the, the VM's IP based on the BGP. It's our basic network model. And it's working, and it's not that, not that bad, actually even though you cannot using the L2 level network inside of the VM. That means if, you, if you're running the JBoss cluster or something like that, which is clustering based on the L2 layers link, it does not, yeah, it, 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 it does not working on our cluster. But if you forget about the JBoss, yeah, it's okay. And yeah, so what is solved is that when the VM is here, and because of the maintenance region or the computer is going, something like something happened in a in this rack, you can move the VM like that. Uh, before the moving, the routing information comes from the software router inside of the compute node and broadcast to the TOR, and it gets the routing information like that and. The top of rec switches or aggregation switches get the routing information like this. If you want to go their IP address, you go to the your next top is TOR1 and your and from this side and this router, if you want to go this this IP address, you go to here. Yes. Things like that is working. So some of the maintenance region or some a failure, you if you have to move your VM this like this. Yeah. Uh, this migration is very easy because uh, if you have a VM on the shared, shared file system or the shared volume, something like that, the moving, the uh, moving of image or moving of VM itself is really easy. But the thing is, that, uh, it's really hard to move their IP, right? Because you designed it inside of the subnet and the gateway, something like that. But if you have a 32-bit networking and if you uh, predefine the policy inside of the compute node and the TOR when the VM is just moving just like that and yeah the routing information is just flash it and we yeah we gathered to the aggression aggression switch like that so when the VM is moved uh, the destination or next hub is TOR2 just changes right because their TOR has uh, some other 
some new information about the routing, yeah, routing information. So yeah, using the 32B networking and the dynamic routing protocol, we using the simple IP planning. When you making the cluster or when you make the larger size of a data center, you really it's really hard to define the network subnet and the gateway and the TOR or something like that, right? Even though you solve the problem uh, related with the hardware, but you, it's really hard to solve the logical interface and logical uh, geometry of the subnet and the other other networking system. But if you in in the certain networking, it, uh, you just define some some subnet for just the cluster and. Uh, before the VM the inst install or launched, you have to predefine their louders. You can exchange, it can exchange in the louder information through the cluster and or the louder louders. So yeah, the simple IP planning is kind of done inside of cluster, and the resource imbalancing. Yeah, uh, sometimes uh, some rack rec uh, some rack racking of CPU and some rack racking of memory or disk. And some rack racking of the IP itself, right? If you designed it with the VLAN or the VXLAN itself. So at that time, if you want to more memory, or if you can get more memory or more CPU by migrating the VM here to the other rack, right? So you can solve the resource imbalancing based on that network model. Network model. And fourth to resilience, it's kind of, yeah. Actually, we anyway we using the dynamic routing protocol and the router, so it's yeah for resilience. Even though when the computer is gone, right, it's not for resilience. But you can uh, migrate the VM to, to another rack or computer node and uh, set the same IP to the VM. Yeah, for uh, to the customer or to the developer or anyone inside of our cloud. Yeah, it seems like there is right. Nothing changes, if, even though it's migrated, it's because to the developer, the IP is if the IP address is not changed, nothing changes, right? Right. So, but when the uh, it happens in the rival migration situation too, when the VM itself is rival rival migrated to to another rack, but uh, inside of the VM, if the IP changes, right, it it has a problem to the developer, right? Even though they had a, a DNS system, so you can change it the uh, IP for the some kind of DNS record. But if you have a cache inside a cl cloud or the client or in the web web browser, it it it, have, uh, it could it could be a problem, right? So uh, maintaining the same IP is very important when you maintaining the cl cloud or cluster. Yeah, and because we are using the router, it's Naturally distributed, right? You can exchange the whole information through the router, or if you set the multipass between the uh, router, you can exchange the information through the through the data data center or the yeah, uh, even some case, yeah, uh, through the internet, right? That's how the internet is built up, right? Based on the router. Yep. So yeah, the result is kind of stunning because when we uh, when we talked last year, we had uh, almost 9,000 9, VM and the uh, 1,500 project and something like that. And in the, the VM is created and deleted per day 88 times. And now it's come to yeah, 20,000 VMs inside our cluster. And we had a 2,000 project and we had a more Almost 10 pull requests uh, since from the 2014, and yeah, the VM uh, created and deleted 100 times per day, uh, which is this uh, some uh, some point of view or some interesting some are interesting in this figure because uh, they're using that as a agile index. Some some part of some part of people are using this. This number as a as an index because uh, they they their infrastructure is changing right. Some is some is built up and some is gone automatically. So if that number is high, that means they had a really good agility in, inside of their infrastructures or cloud. 
Yeah, we now more than yeah, 100,000 100, active cores inside our cloud. <coughs> yeah, after that, yeah, dev to production ratio, uh, when you see the, see the graph, the production ratio is goes up. It's more than, now it's more than product, pro, uh, dev, dev zone, right? And the thing is that uh, product zone started with, uh, yeah, like this, 2015, and the dev zone started with the 2013. We had a more two years gap, but the uh, numbers of the VM actually beat the, the time gap. And, uh, and the thing is that uh, inside of the production system, they need more memory or more CPU, right? So when, you compare, when we compare with the uh, memory uses per zone, yeah, like, uh, what is that? Like 2000, uh, from 2016 and September or November, something like that, uh, actually the production rate is beat the uh, developer zone. Okay, yeah. VM networking is kind of model and information kind of okay, right? Because uh, with the, that kind of increase, we don't need any pressure uh, in terms of the scalability of the network or scalability of the, our cloud. Actually, our cloud is based on the open stack, open source, but we, need, uh, we, we never experienced with the uh, open stack uh, API or agent or some, some, some related uh, component with the, the scale out issues. Okay, that's working. And the thing is that what about container, right? Because these days, a lot of people and developer and even the uh, infrastructure code uh, developer using container for their developing system or the person system, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Basically, a yeah, container comprises multiple name, name piece, namespaces like network namespaces and the process namespaces and file system names, namespaces like that. Uh, so, uh, if it's possible, you, you think uh, or using the container you made a standard research for the developing system or the production system too. Uh, actually, the uh, container uh, based on the uh, less mutable things like pips and gems words in the packages and uh, using the volume mount or the, the other the technique, you can use the uh, mutable things like configuration on the container, right? So anyway, so uh, you think this, this one is kind of Lego or the bridge for the, your production system, right? So when you build up or you really need more, uh, what is that, yeah, more network, uh, network power or CPU power for your process, you just need more container based on the immutable file or immutable uh, word files. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit different from the when you're using the container when uh, and you comparing it with the, using the VM. But in terms of networking model, it's uh, not that not that different because anyway, it had a back VLAN and tune and tab device and OBS bridge and then space and router, right? You are really familiar with that, right? So it's not not that different, but it's looking different. But when you open the namespace or something like that, it's not that different. But the thing is that the developer, not the infrastructure guys or the networking guys, developer think it's different, right? So you have to prepare something for them. So uh, yeah, you need to understand what is container. Anyway, it's not different, anyway. Uh, yeah, these days most of most of the production and most of solution is based on the using the overlay system. But when you're using the overlay system, you have to think about their performance, right? Even though if you buy more specific or the expensive device, uh, maybe you can solve the performance problem, but it's a little bit expensive, right? Not that little bit, it's expensive. And and the thing is that a container is just migrate through the cluster or cloud and actually it container yeah some some containers that and the container orchestrator building up or the spin of another container inside inside of another another 
VM or another cloud on, or in other, another hypervisor. So you have to migrate, you have to think about the migration and for to vigilance when the container is gone, you have to think about that too. <coughs> and if you want to uh, implement the container cloud based on the overlay, you have to think about, anyway, you have to think about how you pick the packet out of the container too, right? Yeah, the end of the VXLAN or the overlay system, you have to have uh, some kind of uh, exchanger for the uh, for the working with the, the other IPv4 or the IPv6 system, right? So it's really that uh, that system or the that component is, is to have the issue uh, with the default resilience and the performance system too. But if you have money. It's okay, right? <laughs> you can solve the problem very easily. Yeah, so, uh, so another approach for the container network is the node fault, right? Most of, most of solutions or most of open source based on the node fault and the road balancer. It's very easy. Anyway, you just uh, pick the port inside of the compute node or inside of the VM and uh, connect it with the load balancer is, is done. And the thing is that uh, node port has a limited port range, like it, mo it cannot have more than, yeah, how big is that? Yeah, 15, 15, yeah, I cannot remember, uh, 50,000 50, port inside of the, because it, it had uh, the IP tables issues, right? You, don't, you cannot have the more than, more than the numbers inside the Linux network. So yeah, it has that limitation. And the thing is that yeah, it's okay using the road balancer, but the thing is the road balancer is expensive too, right? So when you build up the container cloud or container cluster for the system, you have to buy some kind of this. But if you have a money, yes, <laughs> again, it's okay. So. Uh, uh, we made uh, some kind of some several approaches for the uh, for that for the problem and the for the for that issue. Uh, first one is that uh, route of a container and the bridge subnet and the PGP injector. Uh, uh, the original container just using the container that were inside of the container system. So uh, before we uh, spin up the container, we predefined some subnet which is can route over through the, our cluster and, and put it in the con container. And <coughs> if a container comes up, we can, this container can, co uh, can communicate with the other or the outside world. And the, when the container spins up, we uh, uh, send a signal to the louder, uh, PGP louder injector and the louder cluster. I set the information and routing the container IP to the other outside the world. <coughs> yeah, using uh, using that kind of a model. Uh, but the thing is that our legacy, yeah, we have recorded legacy right now. Yeah, we had an uh, OpenStack cloud, very large. So we have to using uh, OpenStack component for the design. And, uh, for for implementing that model, yeah. We had a uh, several 32 b network on the VM, and it, it actually it goes like this. So we had a uh, multiple interfaces uh, uh, attaching multiple interfaces to the VM, and we stitching it the Linux bridge and container using this bridge. So and uh, inside of the our switch namespaces, there's a uh, uh, actually it seems like the subnet based routing, but it's based on the 32. So if you had a more than 32, not 32, yeah. If you have, a, if you have a many bridges or network, network spaces inside the VM, you have a lot of routing information here. So it's not that look good, right? So uh, you can make the routing IP to the container. So uh, with this model, uh, you can use the legacy-based, legacy IP-based legacy IP monitoring system like SNMP or something like that. And uh, it's not using the overlay, so it's simple. Even though there's a lot of a lot of state routing inside of the our switch, switch namespaces, but you can see and you can modify the 
information if, if there's a problem. But the thing is that, uh, yeah, you have to have a, when you increase the VM for the container, you have to be thinking about uh, the IP count and IP subnet and things like that. Yeah, so we, uh, yeah, we saw, so we heading to the louder, from louder to the yeah, load balancer design. Uh, and the requirement is seems, seems like simple. Uh, just, yeah, you can create the software load balancer with the API, and the API had a con compatibility with the OpenStack. That is the most hard part, actually. Yeah, and if, you, the, if the load balancer is scaled out, and there's some um, yeah, cluster, so load balancer clusters, logs, and metric can be, yeah, can be obtained by the in-house measuring cloud. We actually had uh, the measuring cloud inside, inside, inside of cluster, so we, we had a compatibility with uh, this measuring system. And the, and the road balance cluster also have the same entering IP, because when, when, when it scale out, like I said, when, if the IP changes, it's going to be a problem to the developer, right? Maybe not, but inside our, our Develop when the scale out and the LB itself is scale out and the IP change what right so you have to have a same IP uh, if you had a, a uh, the another uh, load balancer uh, front of the system maybe the IP can change but the thing is that uh, we had a very limited uh, budget for the appliance for the Load balancers, so we we can have more than two or three. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's rea reality, right? So it should have the same IP, just working as an L4. Working seems like L4 system, right? Uh, so and the the thing is that when the cluster, one of the cluster is gone, or member of cluster node is gone, or it seems like seems seems like they happen inside of the cluster, you have to have a check the other state or automatically, which is because it's cluster, right? Yeah, the first one is that uh, using, uh, assigning the same IP to the, the actually did, this is the HA proxy, the VM, yeah. Uh, uh, to assign the same IP to the, the VM, we starting from the one-to-one -one NAS system based on, we call it uh, floating IP in OpenStack. It's really simple, like when the VM is here, so when you want to uh, attach the floating IP through the API, and inside uh, uh, OpenStack and the compute node, there it writing some yeah, IP information to here, which is uh, uh, in, in, a, in a VGP level, it recognized as the connected one, and it goes to the goes to over the TOR system. Uh, so the packet for the this floating IP can approach it like this because anyway it's it's advertised. And the thing is that when the package is here, actually though there's no uh, IP system for there, right? So you have to change the uh, using the IP tables and D not you have to change the IP to the actually, actually the VM. It's just, it's simple, right? Little bit, little bit difficult, but it, when you're using the right routing and the IP, IP table, it's not that easy. So if you maintaining that kind of IP, I mean the floating IP, and you can, if you can double it like this, so Inside of here, you still have the this IP connected and other advertised to the aggregation switch, aggregation louder, and the other VM and the other the other system also can advertise same same IP, like yeah, this IP address advertised to the same aggregation louder. Yeah, this this IP is is ECMP, right? So when you when you, you want to connect to or reach out to the, this IP address, it goes to, first time it goes to here, but it depends on how you uh, setting the router itself. 
Yeah, if you want, if you're setting a like flow, flow based one, if you, if you, if one's connected, it goes to like that, but if you, if you use the other, if you use the another setting, it's based on the like round robin system. So uh, for the ECMP system, I think the flow based one is more better because you can maintain the connection to the initial one, like SSH, it seems like that. <coughs> yeah, so it, Starting with the uh, neutron, uh, in, in an open step, we call the, uh, we, we call, uh, we, uh, we uh, neutron is, sorry. Yeah, inside of the open step, neutron taking part of the, dealing with the uh, networking for the VM. So yeah, it, it maintain the, it can maintain the floating IP. Uh, Actually, it's mixed with the uh, virtualized and the virtual IP and IP tables. So before you're setting up, the, before you're using the floating IP, you have to set the uh, the switch uh, router routers in, in uh, switch namespace. You set, you have to set uh, if you some IP is connected to your namespaces, you have to it can advertise to the other. Allow us with that with that information. So seems like that is based on uh, its working model. And uh, actually, the uh, the first one, I mean the 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 first VMIP is based on the kernel state routers. So the neutron DHCP agent is taking taking control of the this host routing information and. When you're attaching the floating IP to the VM, the S3 system, we call it the neutron S3 agent, uh, taking part of the D and the con uh, and connecting the IP to the, the gateway. So it's it's simple, but it's a little bit complex. Yeah. So <coughs> yeah, based on the the uh, the first model is one. Uh, we spin up the HA proxy inside the VM and the attaching the floating IP and grouping it and doubled it. Uh, the network model is a little bit complex, but it's yeah when the this model is setting and the grouping just to doubled it and tripled it so you you can have the scale out the load balancer right because it's on the VM like like this. Yeah, I know this. This looks ugly, <laughs> but yeah, when you're thinking about the first one, I just yeah copying this to here, and but the I uh, yeah sorry, the, the computer has to different one. Yeah, so just yeah the model is done, and we the the left thing is just implementing it. But the thing is that as you know, model is one thing and implementation the other thing, right? So yeah, we named it the system as a CVL, which is the cloud-based load balancers. Uh, and the first target was the Kubernetes. And yeah, the CVL uh, is based on the Golang, and the it's using the SCD for the data store, and it followed the model one, like the floating IP, and uh, CPL uh, support the scale in and out through the API, and it support SNMP. So you can, uh, our metric system can, uh, our metric system is based on the SNMP. So you can the you can have the information about the HA proxy, the connections, and the throughput through the our metric cloud. Yeah, yeah. First target was Kubernetes, and using the yeah, uh, using the Kubernetes event stream, when you're watching the event stream, they have some message like, oh, one container created and one container is gone, one pod is created, one service is created, something like that. The information comes through the event stream. Uh, we're using, I using uh, this event stream as a triggering source. So when you watching a service is created, then you create the, uh, uh, one v, uh, one LB through the, uh, inside of the VM, and if you had a some, there's a some yeah, situation like you have to scale out the LB, then I can scale out the the LB through the inside of the 
VM, like this. <coughs> and the thing is that Kubernetes also have to have a, the, the external load balancer for the container. So when you're using the Kubernetes, uh, you, you have to use the Google Cloud, which is most, most convenient for the Kubernetes itself. But if you don't have the Google Cloud inside of your system, you have to making some kind of a load balance for the container. These days, uh, Kubernetes itself is trying to making that kind of concept. They named it Ingress or something. I cannot remember. Yeah. So they had a similar process for that too. But it's two years ago I <laughs> already <laughs> implemented that kind, that kind of ide ideation. Yeah. But the thing is that, yeah, in alpha stage, Kubernetes dropped from our legacy container can candidate. So it's dropped, right? So because the thing I don't want to support the OpenStack is that OpenStack that has the, their own the life cycle for the, the road balancer, like creating pool and then create the VIP and, and then create member. So I don't want to follow their life cycle. Yeah, so, but anyway, the Kubernetes is just gone, so I have to support the OpenStack lifecycle. So, uh, she will have to support the pool management, VIP management, member management, seems like, things like that. And, <coughs> and the, the most difficult part is that uh, inside of the OpenStack, the VIP, I mean the LPO IP, should, ha should have, I can have the floating IP too, but my base model is based on the floating IP for the L4, right? I mean the VIP. So it's yeah, there's a completion, yeah. And so I try to using this. What about just forget about OpenStack? But the thing is that yeah, OpenStack is complete legacy. So I, I anyway I have to I don't want to making new cloud for just just for my load balancers, yeah. Yeah, and the thing, uh, except the, the floating IP issues, there's another issues too. Uh, uh, in an OpenStack level and in an OpenStack uh, road balance API, there's no road balance scale out. So I'm implementing it like when you're adding uh, this IP to the member, I mean the backend, then it's, it, cloud, it scaled out because you know, it's a, it's a, it's a Google the name I, DNS IP, right? So you don't have to, you don't need to this, yeah. Generally, you don't using this IP to the backend or something like that. So I pick this IP to the backend members. When the uh, uh, users trying to add this IP, it just scale out. <coughs> and the thing is that, you know, it, uh, uh, when the VM is doubled, I mean the LB is doubled, you can have the, you, you can triple the dev one too, right? But inside of the OpenStack, you cannot using the same IP for the backend. And the thing is that, yeah, scale in out should be done in a real automatic way, like someone triggering or someone, yeah, scale out in, yeah, that's not possible. And you have to support the SSL offloading inside of the HA proxy. But the thing is that at that time, uh, OpenStack doesn't uh, support that, that uh, function in, in terms of their IP too. <coughs> and the thing is that, yeah, every cluster membership should be yeah, added to the CBR. And the thing is that I, the, uh, Developer for the CBR system is only me, so I don't want to take all things like server API to the client SDK and the module. Yeah, I really tired of it. So, yeah, yeah. I anyway, I have to change the model because it had a really complexion with the OpenStack lifecycle. So, the good thing about the floating IP approach is that you don't have to think about the VM itself too. Just float, just outside of the VM, you can use the the LB and the floating IP, uh, LB and NAT and the BGP, yeah. But 
Anyway, I have to change it. Uh, so I changed it to the multi NIC based design. So yeah, maybe there's some changes over there. And the <coughs> yeah, we have to now we have to taking care of the HA proxy VM two. Sorry, yeah, yeah, that is the model too. Uh, there's nothing different, right? Just looking same ugly, but if you look at close, there's no DNAT here, right? So you don't have to, uh, due to S3 agent or the connected IP or DNAT anymore, just you had another interface to the LV VM, right? And uh, inside of the VM, you have to connect it the uh, IP, uh, connect it the flow, I mean the the deeper gateway, something like that. So inside of the VM, actually there's a, either one and the another, the VIP is uh, originally have to assign this this interface, but we using the this 32 network outside of the the VM, we have to delete the IP and uh, set the VIP, I mean the virtual IP, uh, LBS IP to the either one. So it's working anyway, right? But outside of the uh, computer or the TOR system, the routing information itself is the same, even though the first one is the VIP is coming from, coming from connected metadata and now, now it, yeah. It's a host route based. Yeah, it, it's a little bit different, but in, in terms of the routing information, propagation is the same. <coughs> and because it just on, there's only one developer for, our, for this system, so I have to minimize my code. So uh, we, I decided to using the VM orchestrator instead. And yeah, inside of the OpenStack, there's a heap which is the taking part of the, the VM orchestrator. And it's based on the template. And it provides the plugin like the instance, volume, and networking. So with, the, this, with this heat templ template, you can create the, the base element for our design. I mean, my design for the LB. And it provides a stack as a uh, yeah, management element and it provides the auto scaling. So when, when you're using heat and making that group as a auto scaled group, you can have the, uh, uh, you can have the URLs for the scale in and URL for the scale out and just connect it to the, some uh, metric system or some triggering system. This system just auto automatically scaled in, scaled out. Yeah, he also provides the software de de deployment, so you don't you don't worry about the you don't have to worry about the uh, writing new code for the de deploy system. Yeah, and he provides event too. So when the cluster one of the cluster or one, uh, stack member is just gone, you have yeah, you can have the event from the system. Uh, yeah, that is the the diagram of heat. It, when user put the template to the heat API and it, it and this compute their template based on the user input and it push to the uh, yeah, rabbit and uh, the heat engine take the user information template as a stack and deploying it to the 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 VM. So I write it down the I write down the all the VMs and the uh, making the Martinic and the uh, deploying the HA proxy and the grouping it as a heat template and pushing it to the heat API. The output is the LV API, which is the ECMP virtual API, and the scale in, scale out URL. So, yeah, when when you had the that IP that URL, you can use the, uh, inside of our cloud, there's the, we call it 
there's a monitoring cloud which we call it Kemi. So Kemi is uh, is for the every resource in, inside our uh, data centers, like physical server, virtual server, and uh, uh, like the public cloud in a AWS and the OpenStack, the BMIP2. So yeah, to the uh, uh, to the Kemi, you have to you can set the alarming triggering based on the threshold in the URL. So when the VM's uh, CPU or the VM's memory is really high, and the thread, and you, you can set the threshold for that, and the, uh, putting the URLs for the triggering, and it just scaled in, scaled out, right? Yeah. So maybe this last slide, yeah. <laughs> From the performance point of view, nothing changed, right? Nothing never changes, but the actually the CPU engine code is more than 4,000, but it comes to 400 when when I using the heat template based one. And the after model changes, yeah, uh, to change that model based on the rewriting the heat template, I using three days. It's really simple, right? So, yeah, so. But, and if you have a really good cloud, it's really easy to make the new network function based on the the other the other languages or the, the other component things like that. And actually, that's on our beta system where we we're still trying to st stitching it with the uh, our the legacy container orchestra, which is me just yeah right. Okay. So time's up. The Q&A will have to be outside because there is a next talk waiting. Thank you, Andrew. See you.